friends, welcome to Emmanuel. Uh, my name is Drew Oakley, I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's so, uh, such a great thing that we can be together this morning, connected by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've gathered together wherever we are throughout the kingdom to worship our God, our Lord, and our Savior, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, so thank you for being a part of this with us today. Remember that as you follow this uh, stream today, you can comment your prayer requests along with us, uh, whether you're watching the website or on YouTube or on Facebook, wherever you may be. You can comment, uh, share what's going on in your life, or glory signing, share how we can be praying for you, or just say, hey, we're here. Um, I don't have to uh, say with any hesitancy that we all miss you uh, very much. Um, we can't wait for the day that we're all uh, connected back together again and here to worship in person. Um, we're looking forward to that day, and hopefully that day comes very, very soon. I'm going to give you a couple of reminders as we begin our time together today. And number one, remember to keep track and, and keep checking our website, EmmanuelUMC.org. We constantly post uh, not only live stream content and things you can digest there, but also updates. Uh, there was a recent letter that uh, Pastor Kelly sent out by email on Friday. It's also been posted to our website, and so if you haven't seen that yet, please go there. Check that letter for some updates and some important information that's going on. But you can also check our live stream content and some of the other things that are there. Um, devotionally speaking, you can check it throughout the week uh, and give you something to keep you uh, moving forward. I also wanted to remind you that uh, if you're not getting our emails, we try to send out at least one email a week, usually on Fridays. If you're not receiving those, contact the church office and we can help you get connected. We'll make sure that your email is listed there. Uh, finally, I wanted to let you know that uh, many of our Sunday school classes and most of our small groups have begun meeting uh, via Zoom each week um, at different times and, and um, uh, whatever would have been comfortable for the facilitators of the groups. And if you'd like to jump into one of those, there's no better time. Uh, they're a great place of connection. You can also contact the church office and once you get you connected with a teacher or a Sunday school class or a small group that can help you feel uh, a semblance of community while we're in this time of social distancing. Other than that, continue to check our worship guide in the steeples uh, for other ways to make disciples, share faith, and serve others.
pastor here um, at Emmanuel. Uh, at this time, um, let us unite in this historic affirmation of faith as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. Please join me now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So we're worshiping uh, in a unique setting and in different places, but we still want to uh, do all the elements of worship even in different ways. And one element that we always have as a part of worship is offering back to God a portion of what he's entrusted to our care, our tithes and our offerings. So we want to take a moment to acknowledge that you're doing that in different ways. You're going online and setting up automatic bank drafts. You're mailing in your checks to the church. Uh, you're doing other things. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Uh, that is an act of worship. And we want to encourage you to continue that uh, and continue to be generous uh, along the way. In the midst of crisis, in the midst of challenges, it's it's very tempting to kind of close in and to close up, uh, but God's blessings are poured out more into people that are open to sharing uh, the blessings that he gives. God will bless more uh, people that will turn around and share uh, that blessing with others. And so we're going to have an opportunity now to pray for the offerings you're making in these different ways uh, and dedicate this time to the Lord. Uh, let us pray. Almighty God, uh, as you've asked us to do, we've offered back to you a portion of you've entrusted to our care. And we pray that you would take these gifts as a token of our lives. Uh, they would be a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you. We pray that you would take these gifts and use them to advance the cause of Christ through the ministry of this church, uh, in this community, and even to the ends of the earth. Uh, bless the, the gift and the giver. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
bow your heads with me and close your eyes for a word of prayer as we connect with our God today. Merciful Father, um, this has been a very powerful and special Lent for every single one of us. Um, this season has been a time where our worlds and our lives have been completely turned upside down. And while there is much that we, we would be tempted to be in despair over, and while there are things that we lament and things that we miss so much, uh, God, you're blessing us every single day. Um, some of the things that have happened in our communities and the ways that people have drawn together have been such a blessing to see. Some of the ways in which people have been sacrificial to one another to, to help and to, to guide one another during this time has been a blessing to see. Those are all gifts and whispers of the love that has come into this world through Christ. God, um, I, I don't, um, I'm not naive enough to think that there's not things we're not suffering from this morning, that, that there are many things in our hearts and minds that, that um, um, bring us sadness, that, that make us uh, bend down and want to seek your throne of mercy. But at the same time, God, help us to be mindful of the blessings that you're giving us through the power of your spirit. Uh, the very fact that we can be connected this morning for worship, that we can use this technology as a way to be together, that we're not in physical proximity, you've connected us and bound us together through the blood of Christ. Power of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, as we worship, our hearts are all around the world. As we worship this morning, we do that in one voice, and we do that in one accord, and we lift up your name because you are worthy. So, thank you, God. Thank you for the blessings and the gifts you give us every single day. Thank you for this community of people who have gathered here to be a part of your kingdom. Thank you for the mercy that we received in faith through Christ. Thank you for the sacrifice that you gave in the death and resurrection of Christ that we could be made whole. Thank you for coming into this world and breaking our chains and setting us free. And thank you, Lord, for community. God, as we do every Sunday, there are so many things in our hearts and minds. And maybe some of these prayer requests have been lifted up even now in this stream. But there are other things, God, that are in our minds and our hearts that we can barely bring to words. Maybe this morning we're bearing a burden that we can barely carry. Maybe we're, we're overcome with depression or grief. Maybe we're nervous or we're worried or we're anxious. God, you called upon us to lay our burdens down before you. You called us to come and draw near to you and that you would bring us peace. And so, Lord, we take these next few moments of silence to lay down our burdens before your throne of mercy. Lord, in this silence, hear our prayer. Father, we're particularly grateful um, for all of the doctors and the nurses and the first responders and, and everyone that is uh, continuing to, to um, um, make sacrifice of themselves so that we can get beyond uh, this time of pandemic. Um, the, the nurses and the doctors that are still providing care, the hospitals that are still open, the, the people who are still going to work. We're mindful, Lord, that also some of us um, have been sent home from work and that that brings anxiety and that that brings anxiousness about what might happen and how the finances might might go, God, but we also know that you are faithful and that you are good, and that in all of that time, you're never going to leave us. No matter what happens, you will always be by our side. We know that you entered into this world so that we would be able to lay down our vain cares um, of the things that were uh, making us anxious all around, that we could lay our fears down and know that we had support, that we had power coming from you. And so help us to be mindful. Remind us that the power of your Holy Spirit, God, remind us of your presence everywhere we go. Help us to be grateful for those that are continuing to, to work hard uh, to get us through this pandemic, but also help us to know that, that you're right here with us no matter what happens. And God, we're grateful for Pastor Kelly, for this word that you've given him, for his leadership during this time, and for this opportunity we have to hear truth that you've given him. Now, Lord, prepare our hearts and our souls to not only hear this truth, but to receive it and to do something about it, to be transformed, to turn into the disciples you created us to be. Help this be a time of growth and worship for each and every one of us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Lord and Savior, as he has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever.
If you would open to, uh, to chapter 8 and possibly follow along with us today, um, I'll be reading uh, verses 12 through 17. And please hear God's word in scripture this morning. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, come now and bless me to be a blessing. Help me to be present for this moment and present for the people that are watching and listening, uh, wherever they may be. Uh, I pray that you'd help me to uh, overcome any distractions uh, that are facing right now and the people listening that they would as well. Uh, that we would have a, a moment with you, that we would connect with you and commune with you uh, and know that you're here for us, that you want to speak a word into our lives, uh, that you would do that even through me. Uh, but we pray that you would he we would hear your word and not the words of human being. Help me to get out of the way so you seen and you could be heard in everything that we uh, do in the moments ahead. Uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In my last two online sermons, I spoke about how weird it, this online church thing is for me and for the others helping to prepare it. But last week, I got to watch it myself on Sunday uh, since we pre-recorded some of it. And it's even weirder to watch it than it is to lead it. For example, the people I was with wouldn't stop talking. I said, hey, let's listen to the preacher which was me, and they just rolled their eyes. Uh, they kept getting up to refill their coffee or to go to the bathroom or to fuss with their phones or computers, and these were all paid staff members in the Welcome Center of the church. Now, I'm kidding. They were helping with a live stream. They were interacting with folks, but still. From your Facebook post, I know that many of you are doing some kind of weird or different things as well. Some of you are watching in your pajamas right now, either your nighttime pajamas or your daytime pajamas. I just learned that that's a thing. Uh, some of you are sitting around with your family eating snacks like it's a movie night. Some of you are doing household chores. Some of you are watching while others are playing games on their computer. Some of you have a dog listening in. I never thought I'd preach to so many dogs, but that's cool. I love dogs. It's a whole new mission field. The age-old question is, do all dogs go to heaven? Well, they will now. <laughs> just say Whatever new or different things that you're doing, I'm just glad you're here to participate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue our Lenten sermon series. Now, I've been tempted to have every sermon deal directly with issues related to this public health crisis, but you may be like me. I, I need a break. I also need to focus on things that are more certain. It seems like most days we face news or assumptions or theories they contradict what we heard just days, maybe even hours before. So I need a more secure anchor to hold on to in the midst of this storm. So I'll make some references to the crisis, but my focus is going to be on looking in Romans for answers to this question. Why the cross of Christ? And today's answer is so we can live in the Spirit as a child of God. Now, some of you who are regular attenders at Emmanuel may have heard this next story or illustration that I'm going to share, but it's the best one I know to make a, an important point. Now, you've probably heard the popular phrase, who's your daddy? Nowadays, most of the time, this phrase is meant as a kind of taunt, a challenge, a way of saying, I just beat you. I'm better than you. I'm your daddy now. When I was a kid and a teenager, it meant something quite different. When I was 15... My mother and I moved to San Jose, California, from San Jose, California, to a very small town in southeast New Mexico. Culture shock was too mild uh, to describe what we experienced. Now, if you were a kid or a young man, especially, and you met an adult that you didn't know, the most common and important question they could ask you was, who's your daddy? 
Now, depending on how you answered, you were either somebody important or somebody unimportant. If you named your daddy and the person who asked you said, yeah, I know your daddy. He's a good old boy. Then you were golden. Well, that left me as a new kid in this little town with a problem. It was I had to start working full time with the grown-ups in that little town. And I dreaded the inevitable question. It seems like I heard it almost every single working day. So who's your daddy, boy? Now, sometimes people were just curious, but, but other times, most of the time, because everybody knew everybody there, people had heard rumors, and they were trying to poke me or to remind me of my low standing in the community. The rumors that turned out to be true was that my biological father left when I was a baby, and I had a stepfather for a while, but he was a bum, and the last time we saw him, he was on his way to prison. And I didn't know if people were just asking out of curiosity or making fun of me. And so I just learned to say, you know, you wouldn't know him. But I'm the man in my house, and I'm here to work, so let's just get to it. And I had to earn my own acceptance and build my own reputation as a working man. And a lot of good things that came into my life as a result of that difficult experience. But deep down, what I wanted more than anything else was to be able to say, my dad is an important man in this town. He loves me and my mom. He takes care of us. And when I grow up, I want to be just like him. Yeah, that's me, a chip off the old block. My daddy is a good old boy. Now, I don't say that to invite you to a pity party in my honor. I'm over it. I say that because I think we each have a similar need in life. We need to have a solid sense of self, an identity grounded on the foundation that says we're something good to someone we need to know that we have potential and purpose and hope for the future. We also need to know that we have somebody that's willing and able to care for us as we go along in this world. So I hope you have now or have had at some time in your life parents or other family members that make you proud of who you are and proud of where you come from. That's awesome. I know because I have that now. I know who I am. I know whose I am. And I'm glad to be the son of my father. But I didn't have that until I became a Christian. I didn't have that until I trusted in Christ. But when I began that relationship, I began to see myself and know myself as a child of God. After I became a Christian in college, I went back to work in the oil fields as I did each summer. And I met a new welder on a pipeline crew who said, I don't know you, boy. Who's your daddy? And I had to laugh and I said to him, my daddy is the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, the king of the universe. I'm well loved and well provided for. Who's your dad? And he said, boy, what are you trying to be, a preacher someday? <laughs> and I said, no, not me, not ever. I just love the Lord. And I think God laughed a little bit at that. But I didn't have to work so hard to hold my head up and to stand up straight and to look him right in the eye because I had a new confidence. I had a new sense of security that nothing could shake and no one could take away. Now, I hope you have or have had a good relationship with your earthly parents, and if so, that's wonderful. But as great as that is, it's even more important to know, for you as, for, what, for, as well as for me, if you were in Christ, we have the same Heavenly Father. And so, someone to come up to you and say, who's your daddy? You might say, my earthly father was so-and-so. I love him, I'm proud to come from him, but my Heavenly Father, my heavenly Father is the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, the king of the universe I am well loved and well provided for. Now in the passage we're studying today, Paul wants us to know something about our heritage. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are children of God. In verse 15, we are told, those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Of God. Now the word children used in most translations is actually sons in the Greek. And of course it applies to men and women alike. In the context, it's a rich term that describes someone who is adopted as a son. And of course again it means adopted as daughters as well. But Paul intentionally used the word son here because in those days daughters didn't have the same rights or privileges or inheritance as the sons. And so Paul wanted to say to all the family of God, you have a full share 
You have the full inheritance, just like the firstborn son in a family. And the rest of the Bible makes it clear that the sons and daughters of God share equally in the benefits of being part of God's family. Now, in the culture of Paul's era, adoption was an elaborate process where several things happened. First, the person that was adopted became part of that new family. His old family relationships were ended. He became a legitimate son in the new family. Second, as a member of the family, they had a full heir, a full share of the father's estate. Third, all the debts from the past were canceled because they were a new person with a new name and a new identity. And this idea of adoption is a rich one for believers through Christ. We're made part of the family of God. We're freed from our old sinful nature. The debts of our sinful past are all canceled, and we enjoy a full share of our inheritance in Christ. Now, before I continue, please know that every person is a precious part of God's creation. Every person is created in the image of God, and as a result, they have great intrinsic value. They deserve love and respect and compassion and kindness. However, apart from Christ, people are captive to their sinful nature, and so therefore they live by the flesh and not by the Spirit, and therefore they cannot live as children of a holy God. That's why God sent Christ into the world to save us and to bring us into his family. In John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, we read this. But to all who receive him, Christ, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now in this text from Romans, I'm going to lift up four practical implications. First of all, when we live in the Spirit as a child of God, we must embrace our new identity. When we put our trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit uh, comes to live inside of us, and the Holy Spirit gives us the opportunity and the power to change. Now, we can still choose to live by what remains of the sinful nature in us, but we can also choose to live into the new identity that God has made possible for us. When we are led by the Holy Spirit, we're living as children of God. So when you become a Christian, with the Holy Spirit living in you, your basic identity has been completely changed. And you can choose to deny that and to live a contradiction. But the real you, the real you, is forever a child of God. Your true self is the one that is led by the Holy Spirit. Listen again to Romans 8, 12 through 14. So dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation whatsoever to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you keep following it, you will perish. But if, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you turn from it and its evil deeds, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So that tells me that we've got to make a choice every day to use the power that God gives us to embrace our new identity as a son or daughter of God. When I was in seminary, one of my professor's teachers was Dr. Will Willimon. He wrote a book in which he told the story of how his parents would encourage him to do the right thing as a child, as a youth, before he would leave to about to play or on a date or even to his first job. He would take him aside and very seriously look at him and say, Will, remember who you are. Will, remember who you are. It might have been from Willimon's book that the movie The Lion King got that same line many years later, remember who you are, or Fika talking to uh, Simba. And in Willem's case, it was also meant to remind him that he came from a good family with high morals and high ideals, and his family name deserved to be treated with honor, and his words and his behavior was also meant to remind him of his identity in Christ as a child of God, meant to comfort him, but also to challenge him to make wise choices. In much the same way, the Apostle Paul wants us to understand that our new position in Christ gives us a new power, that with that power comes a new responsibility to honor the Lord in our words and our actions. Remember who you are as a child of God. Now second, when we live in the Spirit as a child of God, it means that we are set free from fear. Now, it doesn't take much to imagine that you're dealing with fear right now. There are many people in our culture dealing with fear. That's probably more contagious and anything else that's going around right now is the fear that people are feeling. 
Verse 15 says this, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writes, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind or self-discipline. So what is it about being part of the family of God that enables us to live without fear? Let me share some reasons. First, we have a guide who can lead us beyond anything that might cause us to fear. So imagine that you're walking alone through an unfamiliar or remote wilderness. It can be very scary. The threat of becoming lost, lost to the point of death, is a very real concern. However, if you were walking through the forest or the desert with a person that knew the way out, you would be have no need to fear. You would trust the leadership of the one who had already proven able to make that journey successfully. You'd be also very careful not to wander off on your own, right? You'd stay very close to that one who knew the way through and out. Well, Christ has been through whatever you're going through, and he has emerged victorious. And we can trust him to lead us through and help us to stay connected to our Heavenly Father. So we don't need to fear, because our Father is the owner, the ruler of the universe. Our future is in his hands. There is no one that can ultimately or forever end us or hurt us in a, an eternal way. Now, we may suffer some short-term losses, but in the end, we will emerge as winners in all the ways that matter most. Now, let me just kind of throw in here that if I were to ever get cancer or maybe the COVID-19 and I was battling for it and I finally died, please don't say he lost his battle with cancer. He lost his battle with whatever. Don't say that because I'm not going to go out as a loser. I'm going to go through as a winner. I believe there's life for me on the other side. Whatever's coming up in front of me, I believe there's life for me and for everyone in Christ on the other side. Now, we may suffer some short-term losses. We may lose the physical, the material blessings of this life, but the children of God live by the Spirit of God, and no one can trust or no one can destroy or touch it as at that level of our identity. We are more than flesh. We are more than the things of this earth. We are God's children. We have a great destiny, a great hope for the future. We know that in the end, Christ wins. And because we are his, we will share in his victory. Again, that doesn't mean we won't face, face hostility or pain or suffering in this life. But in the end of our story has already been written. In fact, it's actually a transitional chapter that leads to a new beginning. And it goes like this. Because of Christ, we know that we will prevail here or hereafter. We will prevail, not in our power, but in the power of God at work in us and through us. So we should have great confidence. Now, lastly, we don't need to fear because we trust God's promises. God has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He has promised that he will supply our needs. He has promised that he will use every situation and every circumstance for his glory and for our good. Not always our immediate good, but our long-term good. So sometimes we've got to wait. We've got to wait and trust God until he reveals the good that he is working. It's kind of like this. Suppose I, I'm selling something and a person gives me a certified check. If I've got a certified check, then I don't have to fear that there's going to be insufficient funds or that that check's going to bounce. The, the check is good. Well, in a sense, God's promises are his way of certifying that we have nothing to fear in this life because he has promised we are his. We're part of his family forever, and he loves us. Now, third, when we live in the Spirit as a child of God, we can relate to God with intimacy. Romans 8, 15 says, By him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, the hymn of this verse refers to the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit within us that enables us to connect with God at that kind of spiritual level, able to relate to God with a new intimacy. Now, the word Abba is often described as a Greek or Aramaic term for daddy or papa. Uh, most likely, Abba is just an emphatic way to say father, like, oh, father, my father, when pleading or crying out for help with deep emotion. In either case, it suggests an intimacy. See, in Christ, we have a special and unique relationship with God. Now, like many of you who are parents, uh, you would understand this experience. If I'm deeply involved in some very important work 
and my, one of my sons called and they would say, Dad, help, I need you right now, come. I would drop what I was doing, I'd race out of there, I'd go to them, why? Because they're my sons, I love them. They are beloved to me and my relationship with them is unique and special. That's the kind of relationship we have with God. That's how God looks at you and how God looks at me. It's staggering to think about. We can come to him at any time, the Lord, sovereign God of the whole universe. We have immediate access at all times of the day and night. We have the confidence. He'll always take our call. He'll always respond to our request with wisdom according to his perfect will. And that means he has a perspective to give us what we need in light of eternity, which is sometimes very different than what we think we want in light of the things of this earth. But he's always there according to his will to help do what's best for us. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach God's throne with grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us approach the, the, great, the throne of grace with confidence. What is the basis of our confidence through Christ? We've been made children of God, and so we can go to our Heavenly Father in an intimate and personal way. I said there were four things. This is the fourth thing. When we live in the Spirit as a child of God, it means we have a rich inheritance. Romans 8, 17 says, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And the suffering reference there is about enduring in times of persecution. I'm going to leave that aside and talk instead about the glory that we're going to share in. One day, Jesus told his disciples, the disciples then and the disciples listening now, that we have a heavenly home being prepared for us. In John 14, Jesus described it like this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I go there to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you'll always be with me where I am. We have hope for the future. And let me share an illustration that, that touches my heart. During World War II, the Germans forced many 12 and 13 year old boys into the junior Gestapo. I can't imagine anything more terrible. And these boys were treated very harshly, given inhumane jobs to perform. And when the war was coming to an end, they were just kind of turned out, turned loose, most of them had lost track of their families and they wandered uh, through the wilderness in the area without food, with shelter, nobody willing or able to help them. They'd been traumatized by fear and cruelty and then by starvation. Now, as part of a relief program to rebuild post-war Germany, many of these starving and frightened youth were put into tent cities uh, led by international teams of doctors. Here, the doctors and the psychologists worked with the boys an attempt to restore their mental and the physical health that was very hard and challenging work. And they found that many of the boys would awaken in the middle of the night screaming in terror. Now, one doctor had an idea to help them overcome part of their fear. After feeding the boys a large meal, he put them to bed with a piece of bread in their hands, which they were told to save carefully until the morning. And after so many years of hunger, those boys finally had the assurance of food for the next day, and it enabled them to sleep soundly and find rest. In a similar way, the fact that we have an inheritance in heaven should have a positive impact on how we live. We shouldn't be so weighed down by the concerns of this life. It doesn't mean that life will be easy or painless, but our inheritance should give us a new perspective in the face of the temporary, they're all temporary, temporary problems of life. We have the assurance that we have a positive future promised to us by God himself. Ephesians 1.14 says, God has placed his spirit in us as a deposit that guarantees our inheritance. So we should sleep soundly and live joyfully because we know that our future is secure. Now, I've said that there were four implications in this passage that I found, but there's really one more. And the last one is an invitation, and it is this. If you haven't already, it's time for you to join the family of God. Now, listen again to the beginning of John's Gospel that tells how 
and why Jesus came into the world. I'm going to read uh, this text, beginning in chapter 1 through verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And here's the key verse. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So God's promise is this. If you will receive Christ by grace, through faith, then God will adopt you as part of his forever family. Well, what's going to happen next? Well, as a child of God, your past will be forgiven. You'll be given a new identity and a fresh start. As a child of God, the Holy Spirit will live within you to give you the power to grow and to prosper. As a child of God, you can be set free from fear, for you know that God can guide you through whatever you're facing in life. As a child of God, you can relate to God with intimacy, knowing that you are well-beloved by your Heavenly Father. As a child of God, your inheritance is secure, and your destiny and your future is good. So today's answer to the question, why the cross of Christ, is this. So we can live in the Spirit as, as children of God. Now, I don't know what's going on in your world right now, what storms are rocking your boat, but that's an anchor of hope that will always be true. Take hold of it and don't let go. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, come now work in the hearts and minds of people to, to translate what I've tried to say and what people need to hear to draw them closer to you, to give them strength for these days, to give them hope for tomorrow, to, to draw them to you in faith that they would become children of God and live as children of God in this world. I pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to, to live into this calling and this identity and to reflect it into the lives of other people in all our relationships. Uh, bless the family of God known as Emmanuel. Bless all those that are listening today. Bless and provide for them until we are together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
join us for worship and take advantage of the other opportunities we'll have through the week uh, to bless you and to bring strength to your family. Uh, let us pray together. Most gracious God, I ask your uh, provision and protection and just blessing upon uh, every person that's hearing this, uh, the members of Emmanuel, the friends of Emmanuel, people around the world, the people that they may share this with. Uh, just Lord God, we want to send out your blessing and protection on everyone uh, in uh, the whole community and in the whole world right now. Uh, help us to know that you're with us, you're for us, that you're working in all things for our good. Help us to trust you. Help us to remember who we are and whose we are. And help us to know that we'll be uh, able to come through this as we hold on to you and hold on to each other along the way. Uh, we ask all these things in Jesus' name.